Well, as we come to John chapter 6, verse 36, Jesus is in the middle of what has been called the uh, bread of life sermon. His teaching on the bread of life. And he is talking to a group of Israelites who actually are calling him, calling themselves his disciples. But they're faith and their belief in Him is very shallow as we will see before this chapter is over. Let's begin reading in verse 33. Jesus said, For the bread of life is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to Him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. Jesus told them that the bread of life that he gives satisfies. He says you never hunger and you never thirst. It'll satisfy. And these Jews said that they wanted some of that bread. But since they are not believing in Him, and since they will not believe in Him, and since they refuse to receive Him as the Son of God and their Messiah, He can't give it to them. See, they wanted that bread that satisfied, but they didn't want it under the terms that Jesus laid out so they can't get it. That's what happens today, too, a lot of times. A lot of times, you know, people want forgiveness of sins. They want eternal life. They don't want to go to hell. They want a home in heaven. But people who want forgiveness and want eternal life and know what Jesus says about it, and yet they don't have eternal life and they don't have forgiveness, the reason that they don't have it is because they won't receive it on Jesus' terms. They want it, but not on His terms, so they don't get it. Same reason these people will not get that bread that satisfies. Look at verse 37. Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and him who comes to me I will not cast out. All that the Father gives me will come to me. You know, Jesus is the Father's gift to us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So Jesus is the Father's gift to us. And then we who receive Christ into our lives as Lord and Savior and get saved as a result, We are the Father's gift to Jesus. And so it works both ways. The Father gives us Jesus, and then the Father gives Jesus us. Those are the gifts that He gives. Notice verse 37 again. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And notice, Him who comes to me I will not cast out. No one should ever think that they cannot come to Christ for forgiveness and eternal life. And you know, believe it or not, there are people who who believe that. That they they have been so bad, they've done so many terrible things, that salvation is not for them. And of course, Satan just has a field day with people like that, bombarding their minds with condemning thoughts that they're not worthy and Christ won't save them. And you know, it may work for others, but it won't work for them. No one should ever think that they can't come to Christ for forgiveness and eternal life. And no one should ever think, well, that Jesus stuff will work for others, but it won't work for me. I know of a guy who is demon-possessed. And he was asked if he wanted to receive Christ. And a voice came from inside of him and said, it won't work for him. It won't work for him the voice said. It wasn't this guy speaking. It won't work for him. 
but he ended up getting saved. Jesus says that he won't reject anyone who comes to him, no matter what. 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Every single person who comes to Christ seeking forgiveness and eternal life are the Father's gift to Jesus. Or, yeah, the Father's gift to Jesus. And since, as Jesus says right here in verse 38, He has come to do the Father's will, well, there is no way in the world that Jesus will reject anybody who comes to Him. Because think about it. Think about it. Aaron says he wants to repent. He wants to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, according to the Word of God, that's Aaron would be the Father's gift to Jesus. Now, if Aaron is the Father's gift to Jesus, Jesus isn't going to say, wait a minute, no. Yeah, Aaron wants to repent? He wants to come to me? No, I'm not receiving him. He wouldn't do that to the Father. He wouldn't, Because he has come to do the Father's will, and part of the Father's will is to receive every gift that the Father has for him. So he's not going to turn anybody away. Even for that reason, he's not going to turn anybody away. 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Anybody who has the type of faith in Christ that leads them to ask Jesus Christ to save their soul, be their Lord, wash away their sins, they are saved. If you have the faith to ask Christ to come into your life, save your soul, take control of your life, you are saved. But you're not just saved, you're secure. Absolutely secure. What does this verse say? Look at it. It is the Father's will for what? Everybody that He gives Jesus... It is the Father's will for every Christian to be raised on the last day. And nothing is going to stop Christ from doing that for the Father. You are, if you're a Christian, you are coming back. You are coming back in that body you are in right now, only much improved. It's going to happen because that is the way the Father wants it to do. And somebody might say, but, but I'm not worthy. I don't deserve this kind of thing. No, and nobody does. But that's not even the issue. The Father wants it. The Father is worthy. And that's the, way, that's the way He wants it. And so, Jesus saves us because that's what the Father wants. Jesus keeps us saved because that's what the Father wants. And Jesus will raise us if we belong to Him because that's what the Father wants. Verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. These Jews were not ready to receive Christ. They did not believe in him. They were not ready to receive him. So when he claimed to, to be somebody who came down from heaven, well, they complained about it. They didn't like him saying that. See, when he said that he, that he came down from heaven, they knew that he was claiming to be a lot more than just a teacher or another rabbi or another prophet. Because nobody ever said, I came down from heaven. Not even the great Old Testament prophets made claims like that. And so the Jews, man, they didn't like him. They didn't believe in him. So they're upset when he said that. Verse 42. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? They say, they say we know his dad, Joseph. How can he say that he came down from heaven? We know his father. Well, they were kind of half right, in a way, because Joseph did fulfill the role of a father to Jesus while Joseph was here on earth. And when Jesus was a, a young boy, he fulfilled that role here on earth. But they were wrong to say that Joseph was Jesus' father because we know he wasn't. The Bible clearly teaches that the Holy Spirit is the one who caused Mary to conceive. So Jesus is the Son of God, not the Son of Joseph. Verse 43, Jesus answered them, do not murmur among yourselves. See, this crowd, they were not talking to Jesus. They were not murmuring directly at Jesus. They weren't talking to Him, but they sure were talking about Him. And He knew it. And He knew that it wasn't good. They were murmuring about the things that He said. 
And Jesus told him to stop. Stop murmuring. He was very gracious to tell them to stop murmuring. He told them to stop because the more truth that a person rejects, the harder it is to accept that truth later on. So he's telling them for their own good, stop murmuring. Verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him, Jesus said. So, what he is saying is this, unless God works in a sinner's soul, and unless God works in a sinner's life, that sinner can never possibly realize the tremendous guilt that he has or she has before God. And they will never realize that they need to turn to Jesus Christ because He's the only way to heaven. It takes a work of God. And God uses His Word to do that. God uses His Word to do what Jesus says He will do, and that is to draw people to the Son. That's why it's so important just to give out the pure Word of God. Because when the Word is watered down, then the Father can't draw people. He uses His Word to do that. Verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to Me. See, God speaks to lost souls through the Holy Scriptures and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And those who really listen those who take the time to listen and those who choose to believe what God says those are the ones who come to Christ for eternal life it's like God is broadcasting the gospel to everyone but it's only those who take the time to listen and believe those are the ones who come to Christ look at 45 again what he said everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me they're the ones who come to him Verse 46, Not that anyone has seen the Father, except him who is from God, he has seen the Father. So, the fact that, Jesus says, the fact that people are taught by God doesn't mean that they have seen God. You don't have to see God to be taught by God. The Holy Spirit, who is invisible, He is the one who convinces people who want truth. He is the one who convinces people who want truth that the Holy Scriptures are truth and that Jesus is the only way to heaven. 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. And this, this is one of the many verses in the New Testament, or in God's Word, not just the New Testament, but this is one of the many verses in God's Word that teaches salvation is not by doing good works, and it's not by being a church member, and it's not by... Uh, Ritual, and it's not by any kind of good deed at all. We are saved by our faith in Christ's death on the cross, according to verse 47 and many other places. Verse 48, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Stop right there for a second. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And the bread of life that Jesus is talking about here means, means the bread that, that gives life to those who consume it. Jesus gives life to the people who invite him into their life. He is the bread of life. And he's not just talking about physical life. He's talking about everlasting life. Eternal life. 49. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. Remember last week and probably the week before, the Jews that Jesus was talking to, they were making such a big deal about the manna that fed the Israelites in the wilderness for those 40 years as they wandered from Egypt to the promised land. They made such a big deal out of that famine, that miracle food that God provided for Israel. And it was great. I mean, it was nice. It really served a purpose because it kept the Israelites going for those 40 years in the wilderness. Kept them going physically, anyway. But it didn't give those Israelites everlasting life. So notice 49 and 50 together. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. 
This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat of it and not die. And Jesus is referring to himself as the bread that comes down from heaven. He's referring to himself. If a person, if a person really believes in Christ, they're going to receive him into their life. And if they receive Christ into their life, they will never experience eternal death. Receive Christ, receive the bread of life. Receive Christ, receive eternal life. That's what Jesus is saying. 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. i got to read that one more time. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus is talking about his sacrificial death on the cross here in verse 51. He's talking about his sacrificial death on the cross which is going to pay for the sins of man. If he doesn't do that, if he doesn't go to the cross, he doesn't receive Jesus or if he doesn't go to the cross and he doesn't pay for our sins, then believing in him, believing in him won't do anybody any good. And so you can think about it this way. Jesus' death on the cross is sort of like the oven that makes him the bread of life for everybody who will receive him. Verse 52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And once again, like we see so many times in the book of John, they're thinking literal, aren't they? They're thinking, this guy's going to give us his flesh to eat. He's going to give us his body to eat. How can, how can he do that? They're thinking literal. They don't understand. They don't understand that Jesus is using physical things like his body to teach spiritual truth. That's why they can't figure out how he's going to give them his body to eat. And that's going to give them eternal life. Verse 53. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Someone says that he's talking about Holy Communion. No, he is not talking about Holy Communion. Not at all. Ritual, as wonderful as communion is, ritual can never be a substitute for repentance and faith. It cannot be a substitute for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So this is like you're against communion. No. You know what? We have communion. You guys know that come on Sunday. We have communion every single Sunday morning. There aren't many Protestant churches that even do that. But it is that important in my mind. We have it every single Sunday morning because I see in the book of Acts. You know what the early church did in the book of Acts? Read it. Sometimes it's right there in black and white. They met for communion. They met for fellowship. And they met for the Word of God. It doesn't even mention music. It's communion, fellowship, and the Word of God. And so communion is very important. But it doesn't change the fact this is not talking about communion because ritual, even the holy Communion cannot be a substitute for a personal relationship with Christ, repentance, and faith. Jesus is saying this. He's saying, when you receive Him as Lord and you trust in His work on the cross, that's when you receive the benefits of the cross. 54. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Someone says, I still think it means Holy Communion. Because he said this again. No. Go back to verse 47. Look at verse 47. I want to show you something there. In verse 47, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Right? So what do you have to do to get eternal life? Crystal clear. Jesus said it right here. He who believes has eternal life. That means faith. That means you trust in Jesus' work on the cross. He who believes has eternal life. Salvation is by faith. He who believes has eternal life. Now look what he says in verse 54. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Well, in verse 47 he said, 
is he who believes. And then here in verse 54 it says, He who eats my bread and drinks my blood has eternal life. What is he saying? He's saying they both are the same thing. Eating his flesh and drinking his blood is a figurative way of saying believing in him, trusting in him. They both mean the same thing. Eating his blood or eating his flesh, drinking his blood means to receive him as Lord and trust in his sacrificial death on the cross. 55. Jesus says, My flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. It's real food, and it's real drink. Satisfying stuff is what he is saying. You know, you compare the spiritual food that Jesus gives to the food of this world, whether it's the manna or any other kind of food in this world, there's no comparison at all. Meat and potatoes, that'll give you, you know, that'll keep you going for a while, make you feel good for a while, but Jesus will give you life eternal if you receive Him. That's what He's saying. 56. Jesus says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in Him. When you, when you eat regular bread, that bread then abides in you, right? It abides in you. Your body assimilates that bread into its system. So when you eat bread, it abides in you. It becomes a part of you. Well, in the same way, when you invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, He abides in you. He lives in you. Literally lives inside of you. 57. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. Jesus said that He lived because of the Father. Everybody lives because of something. Everybody lives for something. Or everybody lives for someone. Everybody lives for something or someone. And as a man, God the Father was the center of all that Christ did. He lived for the Father. God the Father was the center of all that Jesus did. And He is saying here as a Christian, Jesus, He should be the center of all we do. As He lived because of the Father, for the Father, we live because of Him, or for Him. And if a Christian isn't living with Jesus at the center of his life, then there's something wrong somewhere. Verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, or this uh, verse, pretty much just summarizes everything that Christ has said so far in this entire chapter. The manna, like uh, any food, had temporary value, but Jesus Christ is spiritual food from God the Father, and He gives eternal life to everybody who will receive Him. Verse 59. This he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. You remember last week how that crowd followed Jesus? Jesus got up in the middle of the night and walked across the sea. Remember that? And the crowd that had been fed the fish and the bread by him, they followed Jesus across the Sea of Galilee in some boats. Well, they followed him to the city of Capernaum, we, heard, we learned from this verse, and they found him in the synagogue. And that's where he delivered this message on the bread of life. Verse 60. Many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? See, they still haven't gotten beyond the, the literal. They're still thinking literal. Eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And so the, the people who heard it said, this is a hard saying. Who can receive this? And it's not that it was hard for them to understand, really, but that it was dis what they are saying is that it's distasteful. They think they understand. They don't. But what they are saying is this is a distasteful thing to sit and listen to. What they are saying is who can stand here, who can sit here and listen to this offensive talk? He's telling us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Verse 61. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at it, said to them, do you take offense at this? And it says that his disciples murmured at what Jesus said. Don't get the idea that that was the twelve disciples, because it wasn't. It's his whole crowd. Because this entire crowd, thousands of people that he fed, 
they are calling themselves his disciples. It refers to them, not the twelve. And this crowd, see, they, they didn't like to hear Jesus say that he came down from heaven. And they didn't like to hear Jesus say that people needed to eat his flesh and drink his blood. So they were murmuring about those things that Jesus was saying. Verse 62. Verse 61 along with it. But Jesus, knowing in himself that the disciples murmured at it, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? This crowd didn't like Jesus saying that he had dis- that he had descended here from heaven. They didn't like him saying that. And they didn't like him saying that they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Well, Jesus is saying, well, you know, if you stick with me to the end, you stick around, you're going to see me ascend back into heaven. And then maybe your views on me saying that I descended from heaven will change. What happens if you see me go up? Then will you believe that I came down? Verse 63. Jesus says, It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Jesus says the flesh is of no avail. He says the flesh counts for nothing. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying my body here, you eating it, it doesn't count for anything. The flesh counts for nothing. The only thing that eating Jesus' literal flesh will do for these people is make them sick. You know, his skin was real skin just like yours and his blood vessels and his blood and his bones and his sinews if they, eat, if they were to eat his body his literal physical body they would get sick the flesh avails nothing he says he's trying to make him understand he's not talking about his skin and his meat and his blood eating his body counts for nothing eating his body avails nothing cannot save him he said that his words are spirit salvation is the work of the Holy Spirit when somebody receives him by trusting in him. Verse 64. But there are some of you that do not believe, for Jesus knew from the first who those were that did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Notice what verse 64 says here. Notice very carefully there's an important word there. But there are some of you who some of you that do not believe, for Jesus know knew from the first those who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And it's not that some of these people could not believe. It's not that they could not believe in Christ. It's that they would not believe in Christ. And some of your translations probably translate it that way. They, not that they could not, it's that they would not believe in him. Jesus did not speak some sort of esoteric New Age babble. And some of these people that, that these New Agers that lecture on these subjects, they talk in circles, and they don't even know what they're saying. Jesus did not talk in circles. He spoke the plain, simple, clear truth, easy for anybody to understand. There's nothing complicated at all about the message of salvation. So it's not that they, it's not that they could not believe. It's that they would not believe. And he spoke the truth. It was plain. It was simple. It was under understand, easy to understand. And God has, God has given everybody the ability to receive truth. So those who don't, those who hear the truth and don't receive the truth, choose not to receive the truth. At least at this point. Verse 65. <clears throat> and he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And with those words, Jesus has just insulted the pride of man. He just insulted the pride of man which thinks that they are good enough somehow to earn salvation on their own. Not so. Notice what he says here again in 65. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the Father. Far from being able to earn salvation by our own works or our own volition, it's impossible. Jesus is saying anything good that we are, anything good that we do, is a gift of God's grace, including even the willingness 
to want to come to Christ. No one can come to Him unless the Father draws them. Verse 66. After this, many of His disciples drew back and no longer went with Him. And believe me, these disciples who called themselves disciples were never really disciples to begin with. Many of them drew back to quit following. He lost thousands of people that day. With this one sermon, he lost thousands of people. But they were never truly believers. They may have followed him in a superficial way for some reason for a little while, probably to get you know breakfast and supper and to watch him do his miracles. But, but only in a superficial way. They didn't follow him because... You know, they appreciated who He really was, the Holy Son of God. And I can prove it to you. You can flip over to 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, or just listen to what I read here. Because many of these people, they followed Him for a while, they called themselves disciples, and then they quit following Him. Listen to what 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 says. It says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be plain that they are not all of us. You ever hear anybody say, I used to be a born-again Christian, but now I'm not? Ted Turner I heard say that one time. I used to be a born-again Christian, but now I'm not. No, you were not. You were never a born-again Christian. You, no. The fact that you stopped following Christ proves that you never were a Christian to begin with. You never had a conversion. And that's the case with thousands of people this day as Jesus delivered this sermon, 66 and 67. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? It seems like the twelve were the only ones standing there, doesn't it? Because he just spoke to them, You want to leave too? Because all these disciples left thousands of people walked away from him. Christ really knew how to empty a church. <laughs> empty? How about, a church build, how about a church building program? Put Jesus in charge. His tactics would not be welcome today. He knew how to empty a church. He would just give out the pure word of God to a bunch of lukewarm at best followers of Christ and they will run and they will not come back. They'll go down the street where their ears will be tickled or where they'll be entertained. Like I had a pastor tell me one time, Mike, I find that most people come to church to be entertained. And that was in response to my question, why are you entertaining and not giving out the word? Because that's what the people want. They want to be entertained. I've shared that with you. That's insanity to me. Spiritually crazy. Certainly nothing that Jesus did. Verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter speaks up. He's In response to Jesus' question, you guys going to leave too? Peter says, you know, we're not going to go. If we leave you, we're damning ourselves to hell. Why would we go anywhere else? And then, Peter, you know, he's speaking for everybody he thinks. Look at verse 69. He continues. Peter says, And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter, speaking on behalf of the twelve, he thinks, he says, We have believed and we have come to know. We know that you are the Holy One of God. And that's why we're not going to leave you. Because we know that you are the Holy One of God. And this goes along with what I said earlier. Anybody who would walk away from Christ and no longer call themselves a Christian, never really believed in Him to begin with. Never really. Not a deep down, in their heart, conversion to Christ. Never. Because if you really believe and you really know, you do what the disciples did. You stick with them. Don't walk away. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you in the twelve, or the twelve, and one of you is a devil? Now, Peter claimed to be speaking for all twelve of those guys, didn't he? In verses 68 and 69, he said, We have believed and we have come to know. Well, Jesus is correcting Peter here. You give him a little bit of a rebuke, I think. Peter should not be so confident that all the twelve are true believers. Because as he says here, Jesus says here, one of you is a devil. And that's talking about Judas. We'll close with verse 71. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was to betray him. Do you know that Jesus knew 
that Judas was going to betray him probably long before Judas even knew that he was going to.